Well, we are going to deal in a very serious way this morning concerning some developments that happened as recent as last Friday. There was a raid at a warehouse in Trin City, of course, uh, based on the raid, I'm looking at the news cycle, and it's said that drugs and, and certain medication was, was seized. And I'm looking at the said medication, and I'm saying to myself, well, this is over-the-counter stuff, and I'm reading through the story, and I'm trying to make sense of it, but something seems to be amiss. And to bring some clarity to not only myself, but to Trinidad and Tobago this morning, we welcome the chairman of the Private Pharmacy Business Chamber, Glenn Suchet, and we also welcome Savi Ramroop, treasurer, Private Pharmacy Business Chamber, and of course, a pharmacist. So, of course, to Mr. Suchet, uh, Suchet uh, of course, and to Ms. Uh, Ramroop, Glenn and Savi, I want to say good morning. I want to say thank you for being here. I look forward to the clarity because from what I'm seeing via the new cycle, 1962 was the last time there were amendments to the act that governs pharmaceuticals in this country, and that is mind-blowing to me. Uh, Glenn and Savi, good morning. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Glenn, let me ask you, as it pertains to this particular raid, this particular moment we find ourselves in, I was looking at your response in The Guardian. You were suggesting that we need to tackle this from a legislative standpoint. We need to amend certain laws so that what's happening as it pertains to the smaller pharmacies who clearly seem to be at risk with what's going on at this current point in time, they are protected. Well, yes. The, 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 over the last three months, there have been some very, I would use the word, calculated measures being done by the Food and Drug Administration or the Chemistry Food and Drug Division to regularize, legitimize, and make the industry proper, correct, and right in terms of what is registered to sell or not. What they are doing is, yes, legal. We are not saying that what they are doing is illegal. The situation that has, it has reached her is that these products that we are seeing clearly displayed here, and products that all of us are familiar with worldwide mm -hmm. and locally for all these years, are not dangerous products. They are safe products. Because I'm watching everything from airborne that people take, uh, you know, just Airborne, uh, emergency, right. hemorrhoidal ointments, mucinex, bino, alka-seltzer, and you saw, I'll, just to use something as an example, this product was registered many years ago by one of the major companies. And uh, any slight change in packaging or change in manufacture, it needs to do a supplemental registration. Mm. Any product coming into the country, whether it's pharmaceuticals that are first, second, or third schedule, meaning antibiotic, narcotic, or controlled drugs, mm. or OTCs must be registered. But there are certain category of products in first world countries in America, you don't need to get emergency or laxatives or Dayquil or NyQuil or Philips Milk of Magnesia or fiber tablets or Sudapen. Everything is OTC and freely sale. There's a certificate of free sale that you can obtain and provide to our administration here when you want to bring in these products. Because the reality is, and I'll bring Savi into the discussion, when I saw the development and it, it, it was via the social media in the news cycle on Friday. I thought it was probably antibiotics. I didn't realize it was over the counters, regular, like, I mean, fix, come on. Yeah. Um, so, so what's the real crux here? Because I'm trying to figure out if this was taken from a warehouse, um, what's going on? What's the real play on the back end here? Is it based on smaller pharmacies, not getting access to said drugs so that people are now channeled in a different direction? Well, what, what's really happening here is we have the bigger um, companies. They are trying to get their products in all small pharmacies. And um, these substitute products, which they say is not registered, which fall us under OTC, they're saying you can't have it on the shelf. What we are trying to do as a group as Glenn rightly said, OTCs should be for free sale so that we as pharmacists, because I have a pharmacy in Point Fortin and I deal with lower income people, as pharmacists we need options. 
we need uh, products that could suit our customer's pocket because we are dealing with health. We need to give people something to help them. So in that regard, and I guess uh, we could also win. Glenn, I want to ask you, when you go to the pharmacy and you're asking for a particular drug, and then sometimes the pharmacist will say, well, you know what, we have the generic, mm -hmm. which most cases would be cheaper than the original or what would have been uh, recommended by, let's say, a medical professional. Is that common practice? Is that best practice? Is that fit for purpose practice? Well, yes, it is common practice and it is not a bad practice. If a doctor writes, if, if you get a prescription for an item and a doctor writes the drug name, we have the option of offering you the branded product, which will be definitely more expensive, mm -hmm. or we have the option of uh, giving you a generic product, which is supposed to be registered because of its efficacy, competency, and you know that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. It's up to you as the patient to decide if you want. However, if a doctor writes a brand name product, you cannot give a generic or a substitute unless you can communicate that to him and he's able to give the okay. You know, what's, what's interesting, there are pharmacies already with certain products on shelves. Mm. And the fact that the, 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 the products, so in my mind, again, I, I have no, uh, no, I'm not versed within your, your field, but I'm looking at this from a common sense standpoint. How these items reach in the island in the first place, they would have been clearly approved by customs. Thank you very much. And this is one of the main things that we would like to, to, to discuss, and, uh, and we may have to spend some time on this. Firstly, all these products you are seeing here on the table are available in a set of super pharmacies in this country. One month ago, I made an official report with these items being presented via pictures and invoices purchasing, but to date, nothing has been done. However, all these smaller pharmacies and the competitive retail pharmacies, similar to the one that was raided, those are the ones being targeted. And there's a specific drive by the monopoly of the large distributors to do away with the medium and smaller traders and the medium and smaller pharmacies for the proliferation and growth of the major distributors and big pharma. Now, the minister and chemistry, food and drugs are all in their, within their realm and legal framework to be doing what they are doing. But chemistry, food and drug division is severely understaffed they are ill-equipped. We have no testing facilities in this country for any, to, to determine if anything is really good or bad, and they just go by what you provide to them. We don't even have the right professionals or enough pharmacists in chemistry, food, and drugs. Let me ask Savi here, because, again, uh, lot, lots, lots that's uh, coming out this morning, it is indeed mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. This particular read that transpired on Friday, that was uh, well, the TTP has got involved because they went mm -hmm. in. Um, from your standpoint, from your investigation, was it based on collaboration with the said CFDD, the Chemistry Food Drugs Division? Um, how does that go about? And again, why seize products in a warehouse that's already on the island and that would have gone through customs? Well, what happened here is somebody got a, a, a probably a tip off, or this particular person was targeted. For some reason, I can't say. But um, if, if you look at, at the information that is put out there, you have things like, like chest rubs and all these things that you know you would think it's, it's, it's narcotic, it's, it's dangerous drugs, which, which is not good for the, yeah. the um, business. Can I? And it's not that uh, these drugs were expired or anything? No, no, no. Can I intervene here, um, GW? I would like to point out something to you. Everything that you are seeing here, everything in the warehouse that was seized, were all brought in through customs, yes. legally. The broker right now is pulling here out of his head because he cannot understand how customs and food and drugs have stamped these documents, allowed it to come into the country. It is on pharmacy shelves, it's in the warehouse, but the Ministry of Health and food and drugs are coming to seize it. Maybe they should get their act together and get food and drugs, customs, to work together to stop it from the point of entry. Well, let me throw a curveball at, at mm -hmm. you, uh, 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 Savi and Glenn. What about drugs that come into the country and you're looking at the box and the writing is clearly in Spanish, it's in French, it's looking like it's in German. Um, how would that reach? Exactly. How would that reach this into the country? This is a good example. The major distributor in this country bought in this product about two months ago 
Nothing on it indicates anything in English. It is completely illegal. But the major, the biggest company in this country brought this in, put it on pharmacy shelves, and only when it was brought to the attention to the national media and public, they were all pulled up. And that was imported customs and food and drugs approved for entry in the country. But I didn't see anybody go into that warehouse and season that. Is this common practice? No, it is not common practice. Mm -hmm widespread but yes there are instances where you are getting products now coming with arabic pakistan um spanish and english and that and that i would imagine um you know obviously english is the first language yeah this would be english is it, the first language this is illegal but that illegal okay okay well, you know, when I saw the article, I really was of the opinion it would have been, I thought it was like, as you rightfully said, um, antibiotics, probably, you know, like mm -hmm. narcotics, like mm -hmm. serious drugs. These yeah. are things that Listen, doctor that prescribed, I didn't realize was over the counter. $10 million in quarantine. When you hear something like that, you think it's probably cocaine or marijuana <laughs> or some guns in our warehouse. Mm. Those are drugs that we have in our dispensary. Those are drugs that, that are there. And because of the current situation, they just close the place. And, and using the words quarantine. So if there is, let me ask you now, in, in real time, if there is indeed a monopoly on some of these over-the-counter drugs, these mommy and daddy recommended, this is what oh. any mother, father, grandparents will go mm -hmm. if a child, somebody at home is mm -hmm. not well. These are the basics, right? Mm -hmm. If there is indeed a monopoly, if that is able to become a reality, what will happen to the small pharmacies? Well, it is happening already. The small pharmacy is not able to compete with the big pharmacies. For this year, we have had about four, minimum four, significant price increases by the major companies, whereas the medium and smaller traders have not increased their price. So we are seeing the effects already where things are getting ridiculously priced. And the purpose of the PPBC, our group, which was formed in August, is to form a legislative arm to take legal action and bring the distributors, hopefully, to some sort of semblance of understanding to maintain prices and drop prices. You can't be putting two and three hundred percent markup on pharmaceuticals. And I'll come back to you in a few, uh, Glenn, to, to talk about the legality and, and what could be done from that legislative standpoint. But let me ask Savi because mm -hmm. you said you're down point four, and I'm sure yes. you interact with many people from certain rural parts. I mean, Correct. I grew up in Erin, very yes. close to point four. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the as your ears on the ground and listening yes. and talking to your, your clientele? Yes. Uh, what's their major concern? The major concern is the availability of products for them. I'll give you an example. We're now coming out of the pandemic, but did you know during the pandemic, um, simple thing like vitamin C was rationed by one of the big um, distributors. They also have retail outlets, and I'm sure they had their vitamin C fully stocked on their shelves. But we as little pharmacies in point, we had to just get six or 12 a week. That was insufficient, so our customers suffered. We had to, you know, just work with what we had. So when Glenn mentioned monopolization, it's a very bad thing, as well as controlling quantity to little pharmacies, you're starving us. You, we are going to die as little pharmacies. Let me ask Glenn, as we look to get into the legality part of the discussion, do you think there is a political will? Because again, for this to become a law, it will have to start, they will have to do the debate back and forth. It, that in itself is a certain dance. Uh, do you think there is that political will to make adjustments and amendments to what was in place since what, 1962, Glenn? Yeah, where there's a will, there's a way. However, while the legislative arm of our group, we, tend, we intend to pursue that to try to get the antiquated laws to be brought up to our first world standard, there's also the option of bypassing all this red tape and the minister can intervene and speed track the process of registration, one, that is one option. Or he can also intervene to allow the free sale of these into the country by everyone. When I say everyone, I mean, once this is available for sale on the shelves in America, why can't it be sold on the shelves and thing without going through all these two years red tape with food and drug division to get registration? Let me tell you the problem in that now. When this, or vitamin C, or emergency, do you know you are using emergency illegally right now? No, I don't know. Well, that is one of the things that they season. Anyway, if emergency is given registration to any company in Trinidad and Tobago, 
you, myself, and that company can bring it in. But when that company bringing it in, they're going to put an emergency at $100. And when I bring it in, I'm going to put it at $35. Who do you think going to sell more, myself or the big company? Yeah, so it price. is in the best interest of the big company mm -hmm. to cut out, cut out all the small and medium mm -hmm. so that they can take this to pay $10 for and sell it for 100 and not me having to sell you it to the pharmacy for $25. Mm -hmm. Interesting developments and you're hearing it here. Uh, again, you yeah. know, I want to keep this conversation going. I guess we'll have to wrap things up for now. Um, you know, so many questions still to be answered and I'm, I'm hoping that we were able to get some clarity on some of the developments because again let's let's be real part of life um, when it comes to ill health or you're just trying to recoup you have to interact and of course deal with the pharmacies and stuff that could help you to, to get yourself in a gear and you want to ensure that it's readily available it's authentic and there are options especially when it comes to the small small pharmacies because again uh, the small business man and woman they keep the wheels turning in trinidad and tobago and any booming economy i want to thank glenn and safi for coming on let's keep the conversation going and keep us posted and i'm sure very soon we'll get a chance to touch base with any new developments we'll take the break and we come back with the 7 a.m news update after this